please welcome to the stage, Lewis Stedman Bryce. <laughs> How are we doing this evening? Yeah! <laughs> this is our first rally in Edinburgh, hey? Yeah! Are you excited? Yeah! Brilliant, we've got a great night lined up for you. We've got some fantastic speakers coming along and somebody tells me that Mr. Farage might be in the house as well. Yeah! <laughs> Brilliant. So, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming along this evening. It's not easy being a Brexit supporter, is it? We all know that. There's the media out there that are trying to do their best to attack us. I've seen that firsthand. My political career started four weeks ago, so it's been a bit of a whirlwind for me. <laughs> as well as the media, we've got our politicians and the people that we voted to represent us that are attacking us as well. Do we agree with that? Yes. They're undermining our democracy which is the foundation of our society, and we just cannot allow them to do that. And do you know, what, one of the other things I want to share with you, and this is from a personal level, I feel like I've been attacked by some people that I know and trusted because of the way that I voted or, the, or my political beliefs, which is quite sad that we live in a society like that, but that is the reality. But for me, the most important thing here is that we stand up for what we believe in. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So, so, not all of you know my story, so I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. Now, I've not been lifted, airlifted from London and dumped in Scotland, so I just want to make that clear, so despite the accent. So I live here, I live in Argyll and Butte, a beautiful part of the country. <laughs> We've got some people from Argyll and Butte there. <laughs> Amazing. So beautiful part of the country, particularly at, the, at this time of year when the sun's out. It's amazing over there, as you know. And uh, so for me, I'm married to a Scot. My business is in Scot. Scotland is my home, and I'm fiercely passionate and protective of this country. And so when I was sitting there four weeks ago, and that uh, email came out to me saying, would you like to subscribe to the Brexit party? I was like, yes, 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 I need to do this. And so I'm so grateful for you guys for coming out this evening because this is what it's all about. It's all about the fight for democracy. Do we believe in democracy? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move into a short video now. So if our technology is working, could you guys take that away for us? Thank you. Have been betrayed. That is why I set up the Brexit Party. It's why we're going to fight the European elections on May the 23rd. And that is just the beginning of what is needed in this country. Democracy is under threat. And when politicians fail to deliver, there must be consequences. I was too young to vote in 2016, but now I support the Brexit Party because I believe in delivering on democracy. It's time to recognise that actually we are an incredible nation. This isn't about left or right. It's about standing up for our right to be heard. Successful, hardworking, so much to be confident, enthusiastic and optimistic about. That's why I'm supporting the Brexit Party. We are a single nation. We wish to remain a nation. They must adhere to the promises made to the people. Let's be optimistic. And for the benefit of our children and grandchildren, if you want a home and you're a Brexiteer, you join the Brexit Party now. We can do so much better than currently we're getting from our members of parliament. We want to be an independent, self-governing nation, making its own laws, controlling its own borders, and being proud of who we are as a people. Join us, help us, support us, do what you can for us. We need change in this country, and we need it now. Britain needs the Brexit Party, and the Brexit Party needs you.
Now, throughout my life, I've faced discrimination head on for the colour of my skin and also because of who I choose to love. But I will not stand by and watch my fellow citizens being singled out and targeted because of their political beliefs. I just think that that's wrong. We need to stand up against this, and we need to send a clear message, not just to Westminster, but we need to send that to Holyrood as well. You know, I think my mum's watching, so hello, mum. <laughs> There was one thing that my old mum taught me from a very, very early age, and she said, you never, ever, ever give in to bullies. Now, Nicola Sturgeon <laughs> and the rest of the Remain Parliament in Holyrood would have you believe that Scotland voted almost unanimously to remain in the EU. <laughs> we know that's not true, don't we? Yes! So, how about this? There's over one million people in Scotland, one million Scots that voted to leave the EU. And I call them, I call them our forgotten one million because that's what we've been. I voted with you guys and we've been forgotten. Now let's put some context around that because actually 977,000, I think it was, voted for the SNP in the last general election of 2017. So what does that tell you? More of us voted for Brexit than voted for the SNP. <laughs> So here is my message to Nicola. When you're trying to diminish the vote that we received to, to leave the EU, all you're doing is diminishing your own mandate because you got even less than we did. So out of that 977,000, they returned 35 MPs to Westminster. So here's the thing, I understand that that was a different vote totally different, general election, referendum. But why should my vote be worth less than theirs? Why should your vote be worth less, less than theirs? It's just not right and it's just not fair. So the Brexit party is standing up, it's giving a voice to all of us who voted in 2016 and we're going to make Brexit happen. <laughs> So I'm going to do it because Richard's not here tonight, but what do we want? Brexit. When do we want it? No. What do we want? Brexit. When do we want it? No. Get your placards out, come on! <laughs> Brilliant, thank you, thank you. Okay. So as I mentioned, we've got some fantastic speakers lined up, some of my colleagues who are going to be sharing some of their stories and their thoughts around this whole debate. And the first person that we're going to call up today is uh, a lovely lady um, who I've become very good friends with in the last few weeks. Um, and uh, she spent 28 years working around the world with some of our best known brands in marketing at executive level. And so I would like you to welcome to the stage my number two, Karina Walker. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Karina Walker. Thanks, Louis. How on earth do I follow somebody as fabulous as that? Hi, I am Karina Kilbinska Walker. I'm half Polish, half Russian, and 100% Scottish. <laughs> I am incredibly honoured to be standing here tonight as one of your six MEP candidates for the Brexit Party for Scotland. <laughs> I'm so proud of this team, and I think what Nigel and others have achieved in the last four weeks is absolutely nothing short of miraculous. We are, 
we are truly showing that we are here to change politics for good. Now, it's hard to believe that four weeks ago, Louis, Jim, Stuart, Callum, Paul and I were actually strangers. We come from different parts of Scotland, we have different careers, we have different interests. But what we've done in the last four weeks, I think is remarkable and is something that's absolutely unique in British politics today. Because we present to you the tonight as a totally united team. Now, the reason for that's quite straightforward. We have one mission, one goal, and that is simply to defend democracy and to ensure that we execute Brexit. Now, as Louis mentioned, I've spent 28 years of my life working for some of the world's most loved and trusted brands around the world. I've lived for 12 of those years overseas, and those experiences have taught me some very important things, mainly the opportunities that are open to us when we think globally, the opportunities that are open to us when we build global relationships. And I truly believe that those opportunities will be there for all of us after Brexit. The last few weeks, as we've been travelling around the country, have been really one of the, some of the most incredible weeks of my life, to be honest, is we've been meeting people, hearing the things that trouble them, and hearing about their hopes and dreams for the future. And I just want to say, I can see so many people here actually this evening who I recognised from the trail over the last few weeks. And I want to say thank you to each and every one of you. you can, I cannot underestimate how you have motivated us, how you've driven us on, and how you've made us want to get out there and take on Brussels. So thank you. So it really has been an incredible experience to get to here, but we all know that this is just the beginning. Next Thursday is the day when we really do start to change politics for good. Thank you very much. Well done, Barbara. Well done. Wasn't she great? She actually lives over the water. If I stand on my tiptoes and wave, I can kind of see her house from where I live. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So we're going to move on to our next speaker now. So this gentleman, um, he is a, a lawyer by training. He graduated from Dundee University, and he currently serves as a councillor in East Renfrewshire Council, as a, as a, a councillor over there. So I'd like you to give a big hand for me for Paul Walker. Paul Aitken! Sorry, Paul Aitken! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Paul Aitken! Did it? Thankfully, I don't have to speak straight after Nigel Farage, but, but if I did, my speech would be just four words. I agree with Nigel. <laughs> so why are we here tonight? We're here because we've been betrayed by the ruling class. We're here because the two-party system is broken. We are here for democracy. We are we are honouring democracy, defending democracy, fighting for democracy, and the only way to do that is to deliver not just Brexit, but a no-deal Brexit. <laughs> we have been betrayed not just by the Tories, but also by the SNP and Labour. Can I, so, can I tell you a secret? The Tories, SNP and Labour look down upon us. They think we're idiots. They tell us that we, didn't, we don't know what we voted for. Can I tell them on our behalf, they are so wrong. We, we knew exactly what we're voting for. We're voting for independence. We're voting for self-governance. We're voting to leave the European Union.
even now, the Prime Minister is still desperately scrabbling around trying to introduce her withdrawal agreement bill. When it's, when it's finally published, we shall see legislation that subordinates our country to European law and the, court, the European Court of Justice. This is a deal a nation signs only after defeat in war. A surrender document. In the local, local elections in England, the Tories lost almost 1,300 councillors. In the European elections to follow, the Tories will win as few as 1 in 10 votes. In the Peterborough by-election, we, the Brexit party, are going to win. Yeah. But the, co the cause is obvious. The Prime Minister promised us that we would leave the EU on 29th March. We did not. She told us that no deal is better than a bad deal. She didn't believe it. She told us that she would not allow an extension beyond 30th of June. She did allow it. The Prime Minister looks at the surging popularity and success of the Brexit party and draws the wrong conclusions. She thinks that our success means that the British people actually want laws imposed by 27 other countries and want to pay £39 billion for the privilege. I want to say a few words about Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP. Only a few words. Sturgeon has never met a referendum which she respects. Sturgeon, Sturgeon has never met a referendum result which she hasn't tried to overturn. And yet Sturgeon is calling for another referendum on both EU membership and Scottish independence. We in the Brexit party are Democrats. We accept the rules. We accept the results. Wouldn't it be lovely if we had politicians who could see Brexit as a positive opportunity? <laughs> Vote for the Brexit party. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Paul. And as I say, I apologise for getting uh, a bit of a mix-up with the name there. My list has, I'd written my list out wrong, but as I say, four weeks in politics, I think I'm doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to pick up on something that, uh, that, that Paul mentions there. I mean, we, we, we hear Nicola Sturgeon, she's always flapping her gums out in the news, isn't she? And, um, you know, there's one thing that I'm confused about, and that is how she's going to deliver on what she's promising the people. I just don't get this. Does anyone else understand this? What is the logical argument in taking powers away from Westminster to hand even more over to Brussels? There isn't any, is there? Madness, madness. Now, there's a lot that we don't know, but there's some things that we absolutely do know here. We've seen Theresa May be led around by the nose in Europe. Would we agree on that? Yeah? Now, Theresa May is the Prime Minister of the fifth largest economy in the world. And she's been... <laughs> I'm, no, I'm no friend of Theresa's. I'm no friend of Theresa's. But what I would say is, given the fact that she's been led around by the nose for the last two and a half years, does Nicola expect us to believe that she's going to march into Brussels and say, Scotland will not be part of a federal superstate of the European Union. Scotland will not be signing up to the Euro. Scotland will not be sending arm forces to a European army. It's not going to happen. She's deceiving the people of Scotland. We need to get that message out there and let them know that she's deceiving the people of Scotland. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to bring up our next speaker now. So this guy is a very accomplished businessman. He's been in business for 25 years. He's also the chair for uh, the uh, Crime Stoppers Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like you to welcome to the stage Jim Ferguson. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Jim Ferguson!
Mr. Tears, great to see you. What an honour it is to be here sharing a stage with Nigel Farage and all my fellow Brexiteer candidates for the Brexit party. It really is an honour. You know, a lot of people are wondering how we've done it in five weeks, so I'm going to try and point it out for them. Let's give them some tips, because they need some tips, don't they? The phenomenal rise in popularity of the Brexit party is due to three main factors. We have been crystal clear and consistent in our message to the people and our position on Brexit. We have made it abundantly clear that we are standing up for democracy and we are not stopping at the European election. People across the country are joining us because the main parties have betrayed their own members and supporters. The political class within the Labour Party have turned against their own people and we have seen how they have sneered and talked down to their members, some of whom have been members for many decades. The Labour peer Lord Adonis, uh, another one of the elites in an ardent remainder, has told millions of people in this country that if you're a Labour supporter they don't want your vote. Well, let me tell you something. If hard-working, decent, traditional Labour supporters who want to leave the European Union like I do and who feel betrayed, you have a home here with us. As we get ready to take on the establishment, whatever the next general election is called, we will be ready and the policies and areas of interest to traditional Labour people will be listened to. To the 1,000 plus councillors on the Conservative side who unfortunately lost their seats due to Theresa May's treachery and incompetence. We feel your pain. It is my firm belief that the Conservative Party may not exist in the near future. Not just because of a shambolic tenure from the Prime Minister but also due to treacherous remainers within the Conservative Party itself. I say to them, why stay in a party where you are unappreciated not listened to and simply betrayed in the most unforgivable ways. But the campaign has been fun. I'm a bit of a fan of Game of Thrones and I listened with interest when a newspaper likened our rise in public support and Nigel Farage to the Night King and the hordes of Brexiteers marching from the north but not to Westeros but to Westminster because that's coming next, because once this election is over, the Brexit party will be marching to Westminster in the next general election. We are going to restore public confidence in our political system by installing members of parliament who can be trusted. Not only do we Brexiteers feel betrayed, but everyone who voted to leave in Scotland and who feel the way that we do now have an opportunity to stop the Remainer parties in their tracks. It's, thank you. It's why our membership has grown so substantially in such a short space of time. And this is no longer an issue of left and right, but right and wrong, because this is now about our democracy. 17.4 million people who voted for Brexit, as well as those who, regardless of their position on the matter, feel that democracy is being disrespected and are not given a voice we could, in my opinion, see further dissent and further chaos and division in this country. I am fighting for UK independence, and the Scottish nationalists who beat their chest and punch the air don't like it when we Brexiteers start talking about fighting for independence in Britain, because it exposes a major weakness in their argument. They claim that Scotland can be a sovereign, independent country, and then they say in the EU rather quietly. But it's not lost on me. The truth is the Scottish National Party likes to perpetuate the myth that is the sole champion of the cause and when we as Brexiteers start talking about independence for Britain, they get nervous. Scotland cannot be free and independent as still part of the EU and their message is as untrue as the SNP's vanguard that Scotland's oil and the industry supporting it would be the final answer to all of Scotland's problems. Nicola, Nicola Sturgeon is simply being used by the elites in Europe with the old adage of divide and conquer because Britain united is far harder to deal with than Britain divided. <laughs> I'm out of time folks, with all that clapping I'm out of time, but let me just say there are more people in Scotland who believe we should lead the EU than whoever voted for the Scottish National Party. So I call upon you 
regardless of your party affiliation, regardless of whether you're a traditional Labour, Nationalist or Conservative, because Brexit Party is the only party that can be trusted to deliver the will of the people and our democracy. And I thank you. Thank you very much there, Jim. That was great. Good to hear. Um, some of you might have not uh, seen the uh, launch speech that I did, but one of the reasons that I wanted to get involved in this debate was around trying to debunk some of the stereotypes and the way that the media have portrayed us as Brexit voters. And so, you know, they have looked at us, they have viewed, a, viewed us as being white, racist, homophobic, stupid people that didn't know what we voted for. Do you agree with that? No, no we don't, do we? <laughs> I'm glad you're listening. I was just checking. <laughs> so, you know, I want to come forward because I'm a gay black man who lives in Scotland. I'm very proud of the country in which I live. I'm very proud of my Scottish husband. And, you know, I just wanted to put that out there, that I knew what I was voting for. I knew what I was voting for. And I'm getting messages from people every day saying, thank you, Louis, for standing forward and standing up, because actually, you're giving me a voice to come forward and say how I really feel. And that's really what's important to me about that debate. So I'm really glad that I can contribute to that. Um, so... <laughs> So I'm going to move on to our next speaker now. So I got a little bit confused before, but I'll get the name right this time. <laughs> so our next candidate has been working in the, I guess, in the Brexit movement for over 10 years, which is amazing when you think of his age, because he's still very, very young. Would you please welcome to the stage Callum Walker. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Callum Walker. Oh well, that was quite a welcome, and it's great to see so many Brexiteers here. Well, a wee bit of background about, uh, about myself. Well. Like Desperate Dan, I'm from Dundee, and I'm desperate for Brexit. <laughs> In Dundee, we, I, personally, I work for the, the family import business. It's not, not particularly interesting, but it pays the bills. Uh, and what, we're, what we are in is we're specialists in sticky tape and plastic and adhesive. And we import that from mostly China and the Far East. And guess what? We do that on WTO rules. I look forward to trading on WTO rules. You know why? Because once we've left the EU, we'll have the opportunity for the first time in 40 years to create our own trade policy designed for British consumers and British businesses and not for the benefit of Brussels. That's all good stuff, but there's a bit of bad news. If we accept the terms of Theresa May's deal, that won't be possible. We'll be trapped in a treaty with no way out. That's not what I voted for. That's not what you guys voted for. We voted to leave the EU and its treaties, not join a new one. In Scotland, we've had uh, two referendums in, uh, in recent years, and we've got two establishments trying to overturn the results. We've got the Tories and Labour in Westminster, boo, <laughs> and the SNP in Holyrood, <laughs> or boo, we'll go for boo, or <laughs> and, guess, and they're both in denial. The Brexit Party's message is simple. We want to uphold the democratic decision of the people. Yeah. 
No second referendums, no do-overs, no never-endums, and no fudge deals. If you want to get Scotland and the UK out of the EU, vote for the Brexit party. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much there, Callum. Um, so we're going to move on to our next speaker now. Um, so this person is a university lecturer here in Scotland. He's been doing that for a number of years. Um, he is originally from Newcastle, but actually has been living here for the last 30 years. So I'd like you to put your, your hands together, please, for Stuart Wakeman. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Stuart Wayton. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I believe while you were walking in, some people were shouting shame at you. Is that correct? Yeah, well, shame on them. I've, I've been on more left-wing protests and pickets than I've had hot dinners, but I always understood that if you want to change people's opinions, you talk to them, you don't shout at them. As I said, my name's Stuart Wayton. I'm a sociology and criminology lecturer uh, in Dundee. And if you know anything about university lecturers in general, uh, and sociology lecturers in particular, uh, you can imagine I'm not the most popular member of my department at the moment. <laughs> Some of my colleagues tell me that voting Brexit means taking us back to the 1930s. The reality is that their contempt for democracy is taking us back a lot further. Back to a time more suited to the Game of Thrones, to a pre-modern period when we were ruled by kings and self-proclaimed enlightened dictators. They tell me that the people who voted for Brexit are hate-filled bigots. But the hate and contempt that I see doesn't come from the people in this hall, it comes from them. Today's bigotry is not being expressed by Brexit voters, but by those who look down their noses at ordinary people, tell them that they did not know what they were voting for, and who call us stupid, ignorant racists. They tell me that they are cosmopolitan, that they are enlightened and tolerant people who celebrate diversity. Well, I can tell you as someone who researches and writes and campaigns for freedom of speech, the one thing my colleagues and most of the Remainers I meet are not tolerant of is a genuine diversity of opinion. In reality, my so-called liberal, enlightened, cosmopolitan friends are often the most intolerant people you could meet when it comes to those who do not share their opinions. In the hustings, the politicians, the SNP politicians in particular, yeah, boo. <laughs> Trust me, boo, yes indeed. Uh, the SNP politicians in particular, they tell me that everything that is good in the world only exists because of the EU. And everything that is bad is because of the nation. In this disnified version of the bureaucracy in Brussels, everything from world peace to workers' rights are dependent upon individuals like Jean-Claude Juncker and Donald Tusk. Now, and, and no harm to the guys. Yeah. Yeah. 
But if we have to rely on the likes of Juncker and Tusk to ensure our rights, let alone world peace, we really are in trouble. <laughs> Donald Tusk, remember, is the man who wondered out, live, uh, out loud what our special place in hell looks like. Well, I can tell him, it looks like this. But strangely, it doesn't feel like hell. It doesn't feel narrow-minded. It doesn't feel like a hall full of bigots. Believe it or not, I don't feel like I've gone back to the 1970s or the 1930s. I feel like I'm taking a step into the future with a genuinely diverse group of people who all understand that we have a fight on our hands, a fight for democracy. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Stuart. Another great speaker there. So I just want to see, um, have we got some of our volunteers and supporters running our action days in the room? Can I see by a show of hands? So I just want to say a personal thank you on behalf of me and the rest of the team for the amazing jobs that you've been doing out there. I really do. It's been so overwhelming, the support that we're getting from our volunteers. And I'm going to do my very best to get round to every single one of the action days. I haven't got to you all yet, but I'm going to get round there and I'm going to see you all, OK? Um, so um, what, um, what should we do next? <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> I, th I think he might come out if we call him hard enough. <laughs> Gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Nigel Farage! Parliament that is now completely out of touch with our country. I think politics is broken. Our task and our mission is to change politics for good. The Brexit party has been formed because, very simply, the government and parliament do not wish to deliver Brexit. We are fighting back. The whole of our politics needs changing. The two-party system doesn't work anymore. If they thought we were going to give up, they've got another thing coming. This country needs the Brexit party, and the Brexit party needs you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage. Nigel Farage. surprised. I hadn't expected to see anybody here this evening because I have been studying what Scottish politicians say, studying what the mainstream media say, studying what the BBC say, including that distinguished Scot, Andrew Marr. And I'd been led to believe, no, I really had been led to believe there wasn't a single Brexiteer in Scotland, so I'm amazed to see you. <laughs> because that is how it's portrayed. Now, in Westminster, when we talk about the UK as a whole, we're constantly told the 48% 
must be listened to. The views of the 48% must be taken into account. But when it comes to Scotland, it would seem that the views of a million people, the views of nearly 40% are to be treated with complete and utter contempt. And the Brexit party is here to put an end to that. We launched this party five weeks ago today in a factory in Coventry. And I have to say, what we managed to achieve in those five weeks has even exceeded my most optimistic expectation. And here in Scotland, I think the political class are stunned and terrified by those YouGov opinion polls that you might have seen this morning. Because what they show is that our capable team, give them a hand please. <laughs> what the polls show is that our capable team are now in second position ahead of all the others apart from the SNP and we've done it in five weeks. We've got them on the run! We've got them genuinely scared um, and the Labour and Tory votes appear to be almost disappearing as they should because look in that referendum, we had all the big parties telling us to vote Remain. All the big business figures telling us to vote Remain. All the big trade union leaders telling us to Remain. Much of the media telling us to Remain. The official government leaflet that came through every door. Do you remember that from Cameron? But do you remember David Cameron? <laughs> 9 point4 million quid of our money spent putting that propaganda leaflet through our door when it was supposed to be a neutral thing. How I enjoyed walking up Downing Street and posting it back through his letterbox. I really did enjoy that. <laughs> But there was one thing in that leaflet that I thought was rather important. Because it said, whatever you decide, it will be implemented. And we then had, the next year, a general election. Where across the UK, nearly 85% of people voted for Labour and Conservative parties both of whom promised in their manifesto that they would honour the result of the referendum. And then we had 500 MPs voting for Article 50, which put into British law that we would leave the European Union on March. 29. Thank you, thank you. Someone's awake, thank God for that. <laughs> that we would leave the EU on March the 29th with or without. Thank you. Oh, they are, they're with it now, Mr Chairman. <laughs> and when you think about all those promises, when you think about all those reassurances, we didn't leave on March the 29th. We didn't leave, as Mrs May promised us, on the 12th of April. We haven't left by the 30th of June, and now we're told it'll be fine because we're going to leave on the 31st of October. Halloween. <laughs> Trick or treaty. <laughs> the truth of it is, if we continue to rely on those parties and this government in Westminster, 
We will never, ever get a meaningful Brexit. We will never be fully free of EU laws. We will never get back the 200 miles off the coast here in Scotland that should be our exclusive economic fishing zone. We will never get those things if we continue to trust this political class. It is not too strong to say that we have been openly and willfully betrayed by our political class. And I, having spent 25 years of my life campaigning, standing in election after election, wondering at times whether I might go down in history as the patron saint of lost causes. <laughs> but I kept on going. I kept on going. And I did it because so strong was my belief that it is the democratic nation state that is the right building block within which I wanted to live. I did it because I believe in the people of our great country. I did it unashamedly because I'm patriotic and think we are a great nation. It's just that we're very badly led, it seems to me. <laughs> And I see, I see Brexit as a fantastic opportunity, a rebirth of the democratic process in our country, an opportunity to reform and modernise, to have a political revolution so that Parliament starts to reflect the will of the people, an opportunity to reach out, to reach out and start to forge new and better relationships with other parts of the world. We're obsessed with Europe. We're obsessed with Europe. And it's... Europe is not helping us in a 21st century world. Europe is hindering us in a 21st century world. And it seems to me that with Brexit, we can reach out and forge new alliances and friendships with people out there in the world that in many ways we're very close to, and I think a better, closer relationship with the 2.4 billion people that live in the Commonwealth would be a very good thing for us to do. So there's no way... I thought, I'm not going to stand aside. I'm not going to be rolled over. I'm not going to see Brexit portrayed without fighting back. That is why I founded the Brexit Party. That is why these candidates are here to help me. And I want to know, I want to know, are you going to help us fight back? Good. Good. And do you agree with me that our politics is full of deception? Because, because here in Scotland, we have the extraordinary situation where Nicola Sturgeon talks about independence. She says that separating from the United Kingdom, but staying part of the European Union means that Scotland will be independent. And it is, I think, the most dishonest political discourse I've ever seen anywhere in the world. You cannot be, you cannot be independent if you're governed from the European Court of Justice. You cannot be independent if you're in the EU's customs union and single market. You cannot be independent if you're governed by Monsieur Barnier and Mr Juncker. You can't be independent. And I think this myth 
needs to be exposed. There are maybe as many as 30 per cent of SNP voters that do not want to be part of the European Union. And I would say, I would say to those voters, even though I'm very much a unionist, but I would say to those voters, unless we get Brexit, you cannot really have an intelligent debate about Scotland's future and actually what you ought to do, folks, in this election. If you're genuinely a nationalist, is desert the SNP, lend your vote to the Brexit party, let's get out of the European Union and then have an honest debate about the future of Scotland and the rest of us. It has been my great privilege to be back here in Edinburgh today. I notice that the howling mob outside is considerably smaller than it was when I was last here a few years ago. Well, no, I, I mean, quite honestly, if that's the best protest they can mount, I'm pretty disappointed. But, you know, can you imagine, can you imagine any of us turning up to a meeting of Euro-Federalists or the SNP? Can you imagine any of us screaming abuse at their delegates as they arrived? Can you imagine us trying to stop democratic debate taking place? Do you know, the other night in Merthyr Tidville, we had Plaid Cymru lying in the road, <laughs> trying to stop, trying to stop our delegates attending that meeting. And if you think about it, it gets to the very heart of what is really happening in the United Kingdom today. There is a ruling class of politicians and political parties who genuinely believe that they know better what's good for us than we do in our own judgments. When they say that we didn't know what we voted for in the referendum, what they mean is we're frankly too stupid, too ignorant to have been given that choice in the first place. Can you imagine, three years on, with the referendum not delivered, can you imagine if in an African country an election had simply been overturned? There would be uproar. Many of those in the liberal elite would now be having a fit of the vapours. <laughs> They'd be demanding the United Nations be sent in. And yet, and yet, it is the arrogance of those elites that now has stopped Brexit from happening. And the reason we do not behave like they do, the reason we would never behave like they do, the reason why I'd never ever have anybody in the Brexit party speaking or behaving in that manner is because we believe that those generations that went before us made a massive sacrifice for us to be free people. And we, we are the party of democracy. We are the party of liberty, the party of the nation. Thank you. I haven't got a, oh, you're going to do the questions and I'm going to sit here. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you very much for that, Nigel. Oh, Give him another hand. OK, so we've got a few questions from the audience here uh, this evening that I'd like to ask uh, to Nigel on the panel. Um, so the first one here is from David, and he asks, 
Nigel, what do you think of the BBC's bias? Well, do you know what? We can, we can watch ITV, we can listen to commercial radio, we can make our own choices on that thing. The fact is that the £150 a year for the BBC licence fee is effectively a tax on all of us, and their job is to provide public service broadcasting. And I'd be the first to say that there are things that the BBC does well. And I'd also say that around the rest of the world, those three letters, BBC, are synonymous with this country and synonymous with much that is good in this country. So there are some good things about the BBC. Just thought I'd throw that in before I really get started. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid, since the referendum, the BBC's coverage of this issue has been an absolute disgrace every week. Every week. Every week on Question Time, nearly every week that goes by, it's four Remainers and one Lever. How can that be right in a country that voted by majority to leave? Um, and I, you know... So, 12th of April, the Brexit party launched. Within three weeks, well actually within one week, Within one week, we were up at about 25% of the opinion polls. The most astonishing meteoric rise for a new party. Within three weeks, we were actually leading in the opinion polls. And, and it wasn't until last week that any of us from the Brexit party appeared on any major BBC program. I finally got on to question time, but even getting on that was a struggle. And then I appear on Sunday morning for the one-to-one -one interview with Andrew Marr. I was asked, I was asked nothing about the foundation of the party, nothing about why we'd succeeded, nothing about the fact that some people think our branding, our videos are really rather professional and quite good and better than everybody else. <laughs> nothing. Nothing about our candidates, nothing about the election, just a series of quotes and half quotes dug up from things I'd said years before in a willful attempt uh, to try and do me down. And I just decided I've had enough of this, so I started to call him out, and I'm very pleased I did. <laughs> We're pleased you did too, Nigel. <laughs> okay, our next question here is from Gracie. Have we got Gracie in here? Okay, so um, she would like to know, how can we knock the SNP out of Scotland? <laughs> That's to you, Nigel. Well, look, look you know, I mean, the rise of the SNP, the rise of the SNP has been <coughs> extraordinary. Um, Alex Salmon was a very, very effective public communicator. Let nobody be in any doubt about that. Um, I think his economics of what the oil might do for Scotland was somewhat flawed. Um, but he was a very effective politician. Uh, the SNP are not going to disappear from Scottish politics. They've kind of replaced the Labour Party in many ways in Scottish politics. But I do think their influence will diminish as the next few years go by. It is remarkable that Nicola Sturgeon doesn't accept the result of the 2014 referendum, doesn't accept the result of the 2016 referendum, and calls herself a Democrat. I think in the end, it is this issue of the European Union from which the SNP will hemorrhage significant support. But I do think, when you see what's happened here in Scotland, when you see the way politics in Northern Ireland has changed, I now look at England and Wales, dominated by these two parties, Conservative and Labour, and I want the Brexit party to smash that two-party system, because they're serving nothing but themselves anymore. So 
So I think we've got time for one more question here, Nigel, and this one again is for you. Uh, so this is from Gavin, and Gavin would like to know, when will you be fielding candidates for the Holyrood elections? Right, okay, good question. <laughs> well, all right, our slogan is to change politics for good. That means we're about much more than just leaving the European Union. We're about a different kind of politics in the United Kingdom. We'll begin this quest on the 6th of June in the Peterborough by-election, and we will, over the course of the summer, start to interview and vet general election candidates and prepare for the Holyrood elections, prepare for the Cardiff elections, and we're here to stay. So that brings us to the close of this evening's events. And so, unfortunately, sorry about that. Um, but um, before, we <laughs> before we go, what do we want? Brexit! When do we want it? No! What do we want? Brexit! When do we want it? No! Thank you very much. Vote for the Brexit Party on May the 23rd and let's change politics for good.